Hello. Okay, good good morning, good afternoon for all those who are listening right now. I think uh, Raymond was trying to say hello, but in the new normal, we always have challenges. Raymond? Okay. And welcome to the seventh iteration of the operations. Stop COVID then, where we all learn on the clinical so, so field health board member, Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado. Dr. Susie? <laughs> good morning. Good morning, good afternoon to all those who are listening. Hi, Raymond. I know you're uh, in uh, Guagua, Pampanga, where the connectivity may not be so good. But uh, we're here today and we're very happy to welcome all of you to this webinar sponsored by the University of the Philippines and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation on Stop COVID Deaths. So we're looking forward to a very interesting um, discussion today. And let me turn you over to Raymond again. Thank you, Dr. Susi. Uh, before we start, uh, this I, I would like to acknowledge the teamwork and the hard work, more importantly, that all of the members of this uh, collaboration has been putting in uh, week in and week out. And it starts with the University of Philippines Office of the President, represented herein by Executive Vice President Dr. Teodoro Herbosa. Uh, the Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs, Dr. Elena Pernia, uh, is the head, and then by uh, and then also represent represented by uh, Assistant Vice President uh, uh, Maria Angelica Abad, and also our TVUP partners, po, uh, led by Dr. GG Alfonso. ITDC uh, will this will not be possible without the help of ITDC po. It is directed by Director Paulo Pahe. And then from University of Philippines, Manila, uh, the National Telehealth Center, and also the Philippine General Hospital. And finally, our partners at the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, uh, represented herein by Dr. Susi Pineda Mercado. Po. Um, I think, go ahead, Dr. Susi. Raymond, are you actually driving? Uh, no, no, I'm on the, I'm on the passenger side, ma'am. Okay, so kinakabahan ako, baka walihin ka, no? Anyway, so for everyone's information, uh, Raymond's all the way in Pampanga, and I think looking for a better uh, cell site for us to be able yes, to clearly. But um, we've got a very uh, a very exciting uh, speaker today, who uh, I think you all know her, and she was a former Secretary of Health, and... Um, I'm going to introduce her properly later. But when COVID uh, started, she actually just went on her own as a medical volunteer and was the one who organized one of the first huge community facilities for isolation on COVID-19. She's got a lot of stories to tell us. And um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're looking forward to, to hearing about uh, her experience. But before that, I just like to say, and Raymond, I'll go ahead, Muna, with this. No, are you going to be the one to introduce the questions, Raymond? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we'll we'll start with the questions, but I think uh, we'll we'll have the opening, opening remarks po of okay. our opening All right. remarks. Okay. Okay. Kinakaban kasi ako gumagalaw ka a game. All right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm, it's it is my honor to present our opening speaker. Now, I I only met her for this webinar series, and she's the powerhouse behind all the production we wouldn't be able to consolidate all of the units of UP to support this webinar series without her. So it's my my honor and privilege to introduce to you um, UP System Assistant Vice President for Public Affairs and the Director for Alumni Relations, Professor Maria Angelica Abad. Rika, hi, hi. and thank you for gracing the program. Thank, thank you for your generous Susie. Good afternoon, Doc Raymond. And good afternoon to all our participants here in Zoom and to our live streaming viewers on the TVUP YouTube channel, as well as those who are accessing via the Facebook live streaming on the UP System Facebook page and the Stop COVID Deaths Facebook page. I usually work behind the scenes, just as Dr. Susie mentioned. I usually write the words for people to say. But here I am today, stepping out of my comfort zone to express my personal thoughts about this webinar series. 
I see this as a passion project, really as a continuation and an offshoot of what we've started as an advocacy back in 2016 in what we lovingly called cost UP or communicating science and technology research and development in UP. We believe that UP is not just about knowledge creation, but also about knowledge dissemination and just as important, knowledge application. UP should not just be great in pointing out the problems in society. We should also be great in providing solutions for them. This COVID-19 pandemic created a situation wherein UP stepped up to the challenge of providing immediate solutions for our country. The Gen Amplified Coronavirus Disease 2019 RPT-PCR Detection Kit for one, designing affordable ventilators and developing the use of portable ultraviolet sea light for disinfection of trains and other equipment and so much more including, of course, this webinar series on the clinical management of COVID-19. I have been a part of this webinar journey from the very beginning, and I'm very grateful to all those who have joined us from the very first webinar in April, walking unknown paths, maneuvering unfamiliar platforms, discovering new treatments and strategies to combat COVID-19 infections. Together with PhilHealth, Telehealth, and with all the network of hospitals, doctors, and healthcare workers, every Friday, we sit in front of our computer screen or our mobile phone screens, and we try to learn more about this invisible and insidious virus between bites of our lunch. And the more we learn about this virus, the more we realize that it is not invincible. We can fight COVID-19 and together we can stop COVID deaths. Mabuhay po kayo at mabuhay po tayong lahat. Maraming salamat po. Wow. Thank you so much for that inspiring speech, uh, AVP Rica. So and now you know to the to the general public and those who are attending our Zoom webinar, this is how she inspires us week in and week out po with the work that we are doing in preparation for this uh, webinar series. So thank you so much, AVP Rica, for that uh, wonderful opening remarks po. But before we move ahead with the introduction of our distinguished guests, uh, perhaps we could go on into our traditional po, no? na pre-webinar questions and it's being flashed right now on our screens. Um, the first question, it reads po, what is the proportion of asymptomatic COVID-19 positive cases? Option A is 81%. Option B is 50%. Option C is 35%. And option D is 15%. So uh, please log in your answers po. And as it trickles in po, uh, may, perhaps we could go into the next uh, question po, which reads, what is the most common comorbidity of COVID mild or asymptomatic cases in the Quezon Institute uh, isolation facility. So option A is asthma, option B, diabetes, option C, tuberculosis, and option D is hypertension. So please log on your question, uh, your answers po, to these questions. And then finally, and thank you to our resource speaker po, for this additional question, it reads, what is the number one rule or standard operating procedure at the Quezon Institute isolation facility? Option A, no touch rule. Option B, no mask, no entry. Option C, clean hands every 30 minutes. And option D, take your vitamin C three times a day. So as we are going into um, the... Through the questions po and uh, answering po, uh, answers are coming in. Uh, and it seems like uh, a lot of our attendees have a public health background because uh, from 
from how I'm seeing it po, uh, the question the questions po seem to be correctly answered by most of our attendees. So at the end of our webinar, uh, we will have the opportunity to get those correct answers from our distinguished guests. And I will turn the floor over to my mentor, Dr. Susie Mercado, for the introduction of our resource speaker. Dr. Susie? Thank you very much, Raymond. I just want to note that we have, um, Raymond, we have so many listeners, no? somebody from, oh, sorry, we have uh, Gerald Pinon from um, Imos Cavite. And we have so many other people from different parts of the country. And as always, we've always seen, um, we've even seen listeners from, from other parts of the world on our webinar. So uh, you can use the uh, chat box for any questions. There's also a Q&A box where you can ask questions. And we just want to welcome everyone. So it's great to have you with us this afternoon. Anyway, um, we've all seen the, the numbers of how many people are testing positive I think uh, more than now, more than 950 deaths um, and lots of statistics coming out. But actually, uh, there are a lot of people who get very mild COVID. And you may have seen all these huge facilities that have been built for community isolation and probably wondering, what do we actually do when we isolate individuals in, uh, in these community isolation units? And, you know, our speaker today, uh, just on her own, when COVID-19 became a pandemic, went to the Kesson Institute and said, okay, you know, we're going to use this. We're going to turn this into a place for community isolation. And I think it's one of the first that was set up. Now, uh, for those of you who are, who, who are million, millennials, including you, Raymond, <laughs> the Kesson Institute uh, was, was actually established in 1918. And it was called the Santol Institute. And it was dedicated to patients with tuberculosis. And like COVID-19 in those days, people didn't know what to do with tuberculosis except isolate people, put them in well-ventilated areas, and allow them to recover. So it is, in fact, um, what should I say, historic and maybe iconic that, again, the Kesson Institute is a place to go to. And in the beginning, uh, many healthcare workers who had no place to go went to this particular doctor in this particular historic place, the Kesson Institute. So it's my pleasure to introduce former Secretary of Health and a friend who I've known for, I don't know how many years, here I go again. Really? But, uh, I, yeah, Pao was saying something, but anyway, 20, <laughs> 20 or more years. More. Yes, and uh, she was also in the team of uh, Health Secretary Johnny Flavier. So um, my honor, pleasure to introduce uh, former Secretary of Health, medical volunteer for the Kesson Institute, and now the head of the biomolecular laboratories of the Philippine Red Cross, Dr. Pauline Jean Rosel Ubiang. Doc Pao, welcome to yes. our webinar. Yes, thank you, Susie, for that very kind introduction. And uh, hello to all the listeners of UPTV and this webinar series on Stop COVID Deaths. Okay, so, so yeah. yeah, before you start, uh, before you start, Doc Pao, and I think Raymond may want to ask you a couple of questions too, no? Because you told me you're a medical volunteer there. I mean, were you actually, or are you still going to Kesson Institute these days? Yes, I, I still am working uh, with Red Cross and with the Kesson Institute. And you go on rounds to see the patients there? That's right. We we go on rounds once a day with all the doctors and the nurses on duty. Right. I think Raymond wanted wow. to speak. Raymond, yes, go ahead. Dr. Susi, uh, to Dr. Pao, uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Obial, for uh, gracing us uh, and for... Uh, uh, giving us time for you to be able to share your knowledge po, no? Perhaps you could share, I Dr. Rapao, um, where you are right now and the work that is being done in your current location po, ma'am, in relation to the COVID-19 fight po. No, I'm, I'm not in QI right now. I'm here at the uh, Red Cross building. So in in right right uh, I'm I'm shifting two jobs in the morning in, in QI in the afternoon here in Red Cross. And in the evening, I don't know where. Sometimes Red Cross, sometimes QI. 
Well, that's, ve- that's very impressive and that goes to show po the level and the extent of hard work that uh, you are exerting po. That's just like all of us. Uh, and we thank you for your service po, Dr. Uh, Obial. Uh, please go ahead, ma'am. Uh, and I think uh, TVUP will be the one to do the um, the sharing okay. of your slides. Just yes. say po, uh, next slide please and uh, we'll go ahead po with the presentation. Over. Okay. So can we share my slides? Yes, that's the <clears throat> title. That's the introduction. The Quezon Institute for Mild COVID Isolation Facility. That's uh, what we call it, QIMCIF. Next slide. So as you can see, the Quezon Institute is really an old building. Next slide. And the pipes are outside the walls and very spacious and airy. Next slide. So basically, this is the outline of my presentation. The Quezon Institute is one of the first few isolation facilities for mild COVID cases in the early part of uh, March, uh, in the early part of the ECQ. Next slide. So as a situational analysis, we know that asymptomatic uh, patients of COVID-19 account for 50% of cases, while mild is uh, accounting for 31% of cases. So a total of 81% of cases are actually qualified to be admitted in our facility, 81%. And uh, the severe and the very severe and critical patients are actually admitted in hospitals. The the most common symptoms that we see among our patients is fever, dry cough or itchy throat, and sometimes fatigue. And uh, at times there are gastrointestinal symptoms as well as uh, headache and rhinorrhea. And so there are also comorbidities among our patients, the most common of which is hypertension. Next is diabetes. Then we have asthma, heart disease, and kidney disease. So at the onset of this pandemic, uh, during our uh, enhanced community quarantine, there was a need to really identify and separate the asymptomatic and mild cases so that they are not occupying uh, beds in our hospital. So it was um, like very important to establish the mild COVID isolation facilities, which are not actually hospitals, but uh, some sort of quarters or living spaces for our COVID positive cases. But it's very important for these facilities to be also manned by uh, health workers for infection control, as well as to identify uh, developing serious symptoms among the patients. Next slide. Yes, uh, so as you can see, this is uh, one of our wards in the Quezon Institute on the left and the nurse's station on the right. We had to retrofit the building so that it can be fitted for uh, COVID-19. This used to be a tuberculosis pavilion. Next slide. So there was a need to establish the mild COVID isolation facilities so that our hospitals who are treating the severe and seriously ill are not congested. So we were among the first to be established. Now there are about six COVID mega isolation facilities, which includes um, the PICC, the World Trade Center, Rizal Memorial Stadium, the Ultra, and the Philippine Arena. So. Uh, These uh, venues are really huge gymnasium or buildings that are 
retrofitted so that they have individual cubicles for COVID positive patients. And um, the setup is more or less um, the COVID positive are cohorted with common a comfort room and bathrooms, but they are uh, they maintain social distancing, they wear masks, and they are confined in their individual cubicles or rooms. Next slide. So uh, we really were able to establish more than a hundred beds for mild COVID here in NCR. Right now, the Quezon Institute has a capacity of 112 beds and all the other facilities total to 1,200 beds. So the human resource, this is not actually a hospital, so we don't maintain the ideal ratio of one nurse to eight patients. It's mostly like one nurse is to one ward. So on duty, we have four wards, four big wards in Quezon Institute. So it's about uh, six nurses are on duty at any given time. And then we have four aides and eight utility workers and two doctors on a 24-7 capacity. Next slide. So this is actually our uh, organizational structure, very simple. Admin staff take care of the human resource, the information technology, the records, the supplies, and the food logistics. Our main um, budget or expenditure in this facility is actually food and uh, the utilities like uh, infectious waste management and linen, and which are, which are all outsourced. We don't have dietary uh, section or linen or infectious waste. It's all outsourced. So you can see here in this diagram, we have four residents on duty, and we have a number of staff volunteers that take care of the admin concerns and uh, administrative work in this facility. Next slide. Yes, that's how lean and mean the executive committee of the Quezon Institute is. So just a few of us making the policies and directing the operations of this 112 bed capacity hospital. At any given time, we have around 32 personnel in the facility. That includes the Philippine Air Force, who has uh, 16 guards, and we have 16 uh, nurses on duty. If you go on duty in this facility, uh, you go like 14 days straight duty, then we go 14 days quarantine. So uh, nobody gets out once they start duty in this facility so that we don't bring the infection out or we don't bring the infection in. Next slide. So we operate the facility as a um, health emergency facility with an incident command system. So the incident commander is myself. We have one doctor in operations, a dentist in logistics and supply, and another doctor for planning and finance, Doc J. And next slide. So this is the Mancom. This is actually a donated building or container van, but it's not a container van. It's like a prefab. Uh, van that has an aircon, uh, several chairs and tables and beds that serve as our command center or where we have our meetings, where we hold our offices, and this is donated by EEI. Next. So we developed the protocol 
that is actually now being used in all the mild COVID isolation facilities, including the one set up by the LGU. So the, the main goal is to isolate the COVID positive and those that are identified as mild. So our hospitals can take care of the moderate, severe, and the critical. So our longest incubation period for COVID is 12 days. So we make sure that the COVID positive patient stays in the facility for 14 days. After 14 days, we swab them, re-swab, and depending on the uh, release of the results, if it's negative, we release the patients, but uh, so that we will not be blindsided by a negative, a false negative result, we advise the patients and we, we actually have them sign a promissory note that they will go on another 14 days of home quarantine after their discharge from QI. So a total of 28 days after the 14 days home quarantine, they are supposed to get another uh, throat swab or nasopharyngeal and oral swab. So that completes their cycle of treatment. And they are now classified as recovered after the second negative swab. So the vulnerable and elderly and comorbidities are not actually accepted in our facility because we don't have like emergency care or emergency medicine and we don't have an emergency room. And uh, we don't want the COVID positive or asymptomatic to just roam around. So we establish this facility. Our facility actually doesn't have walk-in patients. Most of our patients are referrals from the hospitals or from the local government um, health centers. So they are already swabbed and confirmed as COVID positive in, in the first facility they go to. They are usually x-rayed or laboratories are done and they are referred to our facility if they are considered with mild cases or asymptomatic. Now, if they have pneumonia, we admit patients with pneumonia, but those with mild pneumonia and are now on oral medicines. So we also admit patients above 60 as long as they are stable. We also admit patients with comorbidities as long as they are also stable and taking um, their maintenance medicines. So admissions are limited to 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. and limited to 10 patients a day because um, the logistical requirements is really um, problematic if we admit more than 10 patients a day. But I think we admitted around 14. So we're, we're still flexible and adjustable in a given day. Next slide. So all our staff have this type of identification and this is the main entrance to the ward building. So it's really very spacious and there are so many trees surrounding the building. Next slide. Okay, so upon entry through the gate, there's only one gate that is open, so all persons coming into the facility enter that, and all persons going out of the facility are also going through that gate. So they are um, thermal scanned by the guard, and the referral is reviewed. If they don't have a referral, we don't admit them. We send them back to the hospital that actually sent them to us. So mask is given if the patient is not wearing a mask at the gate and they are advised to wear this at all times. Alcohol is also given for hand sanitizing every hour starting at the first hour or the first minute they enter the facility. Then our number one rule in the facility is no touch policy. 
social distancing is observed at one meter apart. So the patients are no touch policy. The co-workers are no touch policy. So this is observed for all individuals that are coming in as patients or workers in the Quezon Institute. And we practice frequent hand washing and uh, we have a um, triage system for the patient. Red tag is COVID positive and they are admitted direct to the ward. White tag, a febrile persons under investigation is um, triage in the tent area. And yellow tag, febrile uh, persons under investigation is also observed in the holding tent in the tent area. Next slide. So basically, this is our algorithm for all patients who come into the facility. Unfortunately, we were not able to operationalize the x-ray and the laboratory because we were not able to like sign in a rad tech. But we have the facility in QI for the x-ray and the lab. Next slide. So this is us the doctors doing our daily rounds in the wards. We use complete PPEs as do all the nurses and the utility and nursing aid that enters the ward buildings. Next slide. So these are the SOPs that we have actually developed. And this was shared to all the isolation facilities for mild COVID in all the, the facilities in the Metro Manila and as well as in the provinces. So, <coughs> excuse me. Okay. I will not uh, mention it one by one. Okay. So we, <coughs> excuse me. So this is how we manage the patients and um, we provide food and medicines. <coughs> we don't enter the ward when we do that. We leave that on the table in the ward door and then the patients come out and get it, the food and the medicines. Okay, next slide. So we don't allow visitors, no visitors at all. <coughs> uh, patients can actually get things from their relatives and mm, they can actually make uh, food orders, but uh, these uh, staff are left with the guard and we have actually Red Cross volunteers and other <coughs> Pao, uh, uh, excuse Pao, me. Pao, yeah. sorry, Doc Pao. You want to take a moment to just uh, drink some water? Yes. And <laughs> so do that, and we'll keep that. We'll keep the slide on. We'll keep the slide on, and um, just so you can hear. You know, there are lots and lots of questions here, and I think I'll introduce some of them while you're taking your mini break. Um, okay. Okay. So you know, people are asking about: Is there an automatic referral system? Like, is there a is there a uh, hospital where people immediately go? Uh, actually, this is a question from Lucian Bernal. And mm -hmm. there's a number of questions. She's also asking about current capacity, occupancy, um, age of the youngest patient. So these are the nature of uh, some of the some of the questions. Raymond, do you have some questions there that you're already getting right now? Okay. A few questions here. Uh, yeah, just just to run down the questions that Susie uh, mentioned. Oh, okay, can I? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Great. Go ahead. Okay, so we actually have 112 bed capacity, but the occupancy rate, uh, we've reached the maximum at uh, some time, uh, but today it's uh, 91 and we're set to admit 10 patients today. So we're usually shifting from 90 to 100 and 112 patients at, at any given time. 
we wanted to make sure there were guidelines before that we don't admit patients above 60 or below 20. But actually, we, we're kind of um, flexible. So the last patient, the youngest patient we admitted was only 13. And we just admitted her just because her whole family or about four members of her family was actually admitted. So wow. they were all positive, the four wow. members. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so we didn't want to separate her with her family. So they were all admitted. She was 13 years old. Wow. Okay. Paul, wow. you have time to finish uh, all of your all of your slides. So if you're okay now, you can uh, go ahead because I think you've got some important things here on your okay. SOP. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So our SOP is uh, we don't also go inside the ward as often as uh, necessary. We just go in there when when we need to. But the utility also... They clean the area, the bathroom, the floor, only when the patients are in their beds already. So as much as possible, we don't expose our health staff and the utility. And we ask the, the patients to also do their part in cleaning and ensuring that the whole area is maintained. So the patients also participate in changing their linen, in uh, like uh, sanitizing their beds or their areas of uh, occupancy. So next slide. So here's our another view of the door and the tents are in front of the main ward. So there's no possible interaction or spreading the virus this way. And so far, we've been there for 60 days in QI, and we've had three swabs of our health personnel. And of 32 persons being swabbed regularly, or 42 uh, health staff swabbed regularly, only one or two actually um, became positive, one utility or two utility and one nurse. And we found out that these were the utility and the nurse that make takas. They, they went home or they bought something outside the facility. So that's what happens. Next slide. They didn't get the virus from the facility. That's our conclusion. Now, in terms of management, because these patients are actually mild or asymptomatic, our standard protocol is we give them vitamin C as much as possible with zinc, but uh, sometimes we run out of vitamin C with zinc, so we just give them plain vitamin C, 500 milligrams, and they take it three times a day. We also give vitamin C to the staff, so everybody in the facility, it takes vitamin C three times a day. Now, if the patient develops cough, colds, and itchy throat, we give them Lagundi tablets. Because we found out from some of our uh, UP PGH friends that Lagundi has antiviral uh, components. So it's a standard protocol for us for patients with cough. With comorbidities, we provide uh, all the maintenance meds if the patient did not bring their maintenance. And um, we also like have emergency meds, for example, for emergencies like the number one emergency we had is allergies to food, allergies, I don't know, to some of the disinfecting solutions. So, they develop this, and then we provide antihistamines and diphenhydramine. Uh, sometimes patients also develop gastrointestinal uh, symptoms like diarrhea. We don't give anything for that. We just provide oral rehydration. And then for constipation, yes, we don't know what the pathophysiology is, but some patients 
uh, complain of constipation. So we increase their fiber in their diet. We provide milk. And if nothing, if everything else fail, we give them dulculax. Next slide. So just to give you an idea, we have um, at any given time, two batches of nurses in the facility. So 16 of them are on duty for 14 days straight, and 16 of them are on quarantine. Okay, next slide. So we have duty cycles, uh, depending on the, the, the business of the ward. But right now, we're not doing triage. Very few patients are being referred to us that are suspect COVID patients. So uh, we actually admit them direct to the ward. So the nurses that are assigned to the triage are now assigned to the main ward instead of the tents. Next slide. So even our utilities are also rotated on duty. And we have night duty for some of them. Next slide. So these are some of the pictures. The, we have uh, water dispensers in every ward. And these are the water bottles. Before we ask the provider to get them, we actually disinfect them with... Um, Clorox, we spray the cans, and then we leave them in uh, direct sunlight and heat for two days before we bring it out for the water um, provider to actually refill these water bottles. So we do that also for, you can see at the background, some of the pails and deeper that we give the patient. We actually disinfect them using sunlight. That's all. And the, the pillows are also uh, left under sunlight for two days before we reuse them again on the patients. Now, the linens are collected by a provider. They are dipped in uh, bleach before they are uh, collected by the provider. Next slide. So we have aides also that are helping the nurses. Uh, going on duty with them. Next slide. So when we had two batches of nurses and utilities, we had to identify what will be the duty of the utility workers and nurses when they are on quarantine and what would be the duty of the second batch who are now uh, reporting to the ward. So we don't mix the ones in quarantine and the ones that go on duty in the ward. They have different quarters. Next slide. And also we have uh, additional duties which we actually developed uh, uh, when, when we were already implementing the Quezon Institute. Like we got naps, knapsack sprayers from, from DOH. So we use that to, to disinfect uh, some areas of the ward and the, the comfort rooms. And we also got like uh, insecticide sprayers from the Bureau of Quarantine. So they do once a week spraying of the grounds so that we won't have as much mosquitoes and flies. Because our, our area is open air. We don't have screens on the walls or we don't have air conditioning, so uh, we have to deal with the insects also. And uh, garbage is regularly collected by um, uh, outsource provider and linens are collected. Next slide. Okay, so we still maintain strict social distancing and wearing of masks and hand hygiene whether you are on quarantine or on duty in the wards. Next slide. So that's about it. Thank you for listening. We can defeat COVID-19. Filipinos are very resilient and pray and stay safe. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Doc Pao. That was a uh, incredible eye opener on the experience from uh, Quezon Institute. Po ano po uh, yes. for our for our ano po for our um, what do you call this? Uh, our attendees po. Uh, let me just give a rundown po on how how, how the extent po of your um, let's say reach uh, for this webinar, Doctor Pao. We have attendees from. Luis Hora Memorial Regional Hi, yeah. Hello. Mountain Province. I've been there. <laughs> from Cor oh, Cordillera and Bistro Division. Yeah. From Dr. Rafael Tumbocan Memorial Hospital yes. in Calibo, Aklan. Ay, Western Visayas. In Calibo. Oh. I've been there also. <laughs> and then we also we also have uh, attendees from Matungao Rural Health Unit in Lanao del Norte, Northern Mindanao. Wow, po. Yeah. And then you are also international. Umabot na po kayo sa abroad, Dr. Rabao. <laughs> we have attendees po from SWCC Medical Clinic in Saudi Arabia, uh, Armed Forces Hospital in Muscat, Oman, and the University of Sheffield in South Yorkshire, England po. So th those are just uh, a few of our uh, attendees kung nasaan man po sila. But uh, uh, as part of our tradition po, Dr. Pauline, we also have, um, shall we say, an evaluation po of uh, the presenters. And obviously, uh, your presentation seems to be very well received uh, in terms of your knowledge po of the webinar topic, um, how well prepared and organized uh, your presentation was. Um, the third question is all, all about um, the, how clearly um, you have been, um, ano po, have been uh, enunciating po and uh, doing your presentation, uh, the use of appropriate and medical jargons po, and uh, the use of appropriate techniques as part of this webinar. So thank you so much, ma'am. I, I think it, it just goes to show on how expert you are now po on uh, on handling po uh, and delivering yes. this content through a webinar, Dr. Pauline. Um, yes. I just like to add also, as we move on, we actually add policies like the new duty policy. We didn't have that at the start. And then we add policy now for uh, health emergency because there was a fire near our institute. Oh, wow. Then I, I told them, what will we do if there's a fire in our wards? So we have to have like an uh, emergency evacuation um, training or um, uh drill. So we prepared for that. We gave PPEs to all the uh, Philippine Air Force on duty and the nurses so that at any given time, if there's a fire, they put on their PPE and they assist the patients out of the ward. So we're, we're developing the policies as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Doc Pao, Secretary Pao. Um, so many questions here. So many people are greeting you on the chat box. I can't read all of them. <laughs> I'll read out some of the questions that you might want to answer. So someone is asking, uh, Vincent is asking, what kind of recreational activities do you have at QI? And what are you doing for the mental health of, of the individuals who are there? And the, the patients are actually having 24-7 access to Wi-Fi. Okay. And uh, also, uh, they, they have access to our hotline. So if there are, like, problematic patients with um, possible, because we, we had some of them, we connect them to, um, uh, like, a psychosocial provider. That's uh, through virtual uh, psychological first aid. So. Okay. So, People wala, wala don't, bingo, ah. Hindi pwede mag-bingo. No. Uh, we, we actually give them Bibles when they come <laughs> in. So, we, told, oh, okay. we tell them to read the Bible. We have uh, Catholic uh, priests come in every Monday. They say Mass. And then we actually have uh, calisthenics or exercises in the morning. Okay, great. I mean, I think, you know, Raymond, this is uh, a very, very on-the-ground, practical kind of webinar content. Because I think a lot of, a lot of our, our uh, audience are wondering what they're going to do about their, especially mga nasa local government units, no? What do you do about, uh, what do you do about your community isolation? I think Doc Pao has given us 
a lot of very, very practical content. Okay, a, a few more questions here. Yes. Okay, uh, Belen Dofitas. Hi, Belen. Okay, she's yes. asking, um, are you using any kind of anti-inflammatory or immune-boosting bu diet? Or are there certain types of food that you give the patient so that their immune, their immune levels will will improve? And Actually, yeah, yeah actually. We have a dietitian, and oh. but she's uh, over sixty, so she works at home. Okay. But she gives us a menu, but because of the lockdown and the community quarantine, our caterer cannot follow the menu that we have. Right. So we have to do with what's available, what the caterer can buy in the market, and it's usually meat and meat products but mm -hmm. as much as possible we ask them to provide vegetables now now it's being provided but when we started about one month in april we had meat all the time because that's the only available food right okay there's another question here doc Pao. um uh have you seen an increase in the occupancy rate of qi since we went into a general community quarantine madami ba yung pasyente natin or it's it's the same actually in qi we we get the maximum number of patients that we can admit so so that happens but here in red cross i know there are more positives now than when we start i see yeah. okay all right we have okay there's another question here before I turn over to Raymond. And Rika, you might still be there and might want to ask a question, okay? <laughs> I'm teasing Rika. Okay, so um, how how do you know if it's COVID or it's not not COVID? Uh, you're saying that the patients are asymptomatic or very mild. How are you able to, to tell the difference? Um, actually, we... We cannot tell the difference if his cough is like uh, the seasonal flu or they're just having like itchy throat from something they ate. So we don't know. But we treat them like um, any ordinary illness. We And then we do frequent monitoring for those patients. If they develop difficulty in breathing, then we, we move them out to a hospital. But we've not had um, any occasion where we had to refer. Uh, uh, we, we did. We did. Um, this gentleman was, uh, I think, a very uh, toxic patient. He had difficulty in breathing. And when, when Lung Center x-rayed him, he had emphysema already. So, so... We just refer to the hospital if they have uh, difficulty in breathing that we cannot no longer manage in QI. And is there only one hospital that you refer to or you could be referring to a number of hospitals? It's uh, our, our uh, MOA is with the Lung Center of the Philippines even for our swabs. But actually the patients do ask to be sometimes transferred to another facility or another hospital so it's it depends on the patient they they sometimes transfer to private hospitals okay Raymond over to you thank you Dr. Susie and so to Doc Pao um, in line po with our discussion last week in terms of uh, uh, securing the safety and also protecting our health workers ma'am there are questions po kasi regarding gano po katagal ang shift uh, in terms of sa mga nag nurses na nag duty, gano po kadalas mag vital signs monitoring, mm -hmm. and then also, are you able, meron po bang mga instances ma'am na may mga tumatakas sa QI na mga pasyente? How are you securing that facility po ma'am? Um, actually, we have 16 uh, Philippine Air Force billeted <laughs> in our facility. So, uh, at any given time, there are four on duty. So they guard all the exits of the ward. There was one patient who who ran amok, but she didn't leave the facility. But we just had 
uh, one uniformed guy stand at the hallway of the ward so that they really would not attempt to to escape <laughs> from the ward. But okay, uh, so having said that, yes, we, we secure our patients and we make sure that our nurses are not uh, exhausted or overspent. So they do vital signs only one per shift. So the nurses shift every 12 hours. So they do vital signs only once in their shift. Okay, Doc Pao, I have a question. Buti na pag-usapan natin yung shifting. Kanina, I was looking at your PowerPoint slide. Um, Nico, can you flash that slide about the shifting, yung madaming letters? Paki, let's uh, explain po ito ng mabuti para sa ating mga nanonood. Uh, yes, uh, we assign because um, like uh, in Q Hi, we we have uh, privacy and confidentiality. So our nurses are actually not wearing their ID because they are on PPE. The patients, uh, we don't call them by their uh, names. We call them by their numbers, like uh, PUI number one, PUI number 12. Uh, COVID number one, COVID number 12. So that's also how we identify the nurses. We assign them letters A, B, C, D. So A goes on duty in day one. The utility are also assigned letters. So that's how we do it. Okay. All right. Sige. Maraming salamat po. At baka ito ay magaling, de, ma, mabuti rin na sundin ng mga ibang, hindi lang ng isolation facilities, but maybe even hospitals. Kasi nakikita ko sa hospitals, sinusulat nga nila yung mga pangalan nila. No? Yes. Isa naka-ID sila na may picture. No? Mm -hmm. okay. But the, in, in our facility, like even if you have an ID, it's not seen by the patients because you're wearing your PPE. So their IDs are marked A, B, C, D. And when we call them through our walkie-talkie, we call them Ward 1, Ward 1, Nurse A, Nurse A. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you. Raymond, you have some more questions there. Yes, uh, Dr. Rapao. Uh, my question po would be, uh, with regards to uh, how often do you have your health workers undergo RT-PCR testing? And also, are, is, is there any protocol po in terms of, uh, is, is, there, is there any protocol change in terms of uh, the shift from ECQ to GCQ on how you are taking care of your health workers po? Dr. Rapao. Okay, the, the health workers are actually, I told you, you that they go on duty for 14 days straight so um what, what the difference is only they if they go ward day duty the next day they go night duty the next day they are off one day and then they go on duty again so that's how we rotate the nurses now uh when they're off they're not supposed to leave the facility they stay in QI for 14 days. Then they go off uh, for 14 day quarantine, still in QI, but we swab them on the seventh day of quarantine. We swab them. If they turn out to be negative, we send them home, but we still advise home quarantine for 14 days. Yeah, so there's, that, okay. yeah there's a related question here. It says, uh, what are the challenges of the staff who are there on a 14-day duty? Uh, I think um, it's, uh, for, for me, I think, you know, it's not really difficult work. It's not like you're working in a hospital. It's like you're just um, uh, guarding these uh, borders that you have. They're, they're like just sleeping and eating in there. Not, not so much as patients, but we have to also like be observant because some of them like get illnesses while they're with us, like uh, rashes. We have to, to be alert. They have diarrhea. So we watch them carefully for, for other signs and symptoms. Right. Okay. There's another question here. Uh, 
Okay, from Cleo Tabada of Davao, of course. Ah, yeah, Cleo. I know her. <laughs> yeah. Doctor Cleo. Yeah, Doc Cleo ng Davao. Sige, she's saying, Doc Pao, I may have missed this, but how are vulnerable health workers classified to set the work schedules? Vulnerable health workers? Oh. Uh, basically, in QI, uh, we don't have a dirty and clean area. Like, all, all who go on duty actually go into the dirty area, but they have to wear PPE. Right. So, uh, we make sure that uh, all our health staff are healthy. They're not vulnerable. We don't um, parang hire uh, health staff with comorbidity or right. above 60. That's right. a requirement. Oh, so, the health workers are carefully... Selected. Selected. We don't really have vulnerable health workers who, who are... We don't, yeah, we don't accept health workers with comorbidities. Okay. 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 Raymond, so um, from you? Yes, ma'am. There's another question po here regarding to... So, Doc, Doc Pao, uh, are, there a, are there any issues regarding shortages on PPEs at Quezon Institute? Uh, what are ano po yung protocol po ninyo regarding the reuse of PPEs and N95 masks? Actually, we're, we're very lucky that uh, we're the first one to open. So the Department of Health really provides for for our supplies. So in terms of PPEs, I think we're, we have... Uh, more than what we need. That's why we also try to allocate to our partner hospital, like the National Children's Hospital. We we send some of our PPEs there because they help us with plumbing, with electrical works, and with our laundry and uh, infectious waste. So, and then we send some of the PPEs we receive to the Lung Center of the Philippines. So. That's our situation. We don't have, like, uh, uh, lacking PPEs, and we don't reuse our PPEs. Yeah, Sir Pao, you mentioned earlier that uh, that you've only had one health worker who was tested positive at QI. One nurse, yes. One nurse. How do you, how do you explain that? Is that because you're really careful, or is it possible that the asymptomatics aren't really that infectious. And we, we tried to explain that by, we investigated, actually they got the virus from outside. Right. These are the workers, even the two utility that turned out positive, that make takas, no? They go out that we don't know about, that's why we scold the guards. You're not supposed to allow them... Or they, they just said they'll go to the bank and then they went to Pure Gold or to the other supermarket. Right. So they made takas. Those, those three that became positive got it from outside, not from the patients in QI. So, and so, so, so inside, it seems that uh, the asymptomatic patients are not really that infectious yes. or... Hindi, no? Parang hindi. Because they don't, yeah. they actually don't have symptoms. Uh, because our protocol also makes sure that make sure that our staff are not exposed. Very strict. Okay. So we don't don't tell them to go in the ward if they don't need to. So they just stay in the nurses station. When they have to go in the ward, they have to wear full PPEs. So yes. I think that that protocol has made it really um, infection control has been maintained in QI because of that protocol, no touch policy. We right. don't go yeah. in the ward if we don't need to. We don't interact with the patients if we don't need to. They call us through cell phone. We converse through them through a wall, a plastic wall in the wards. So that's how we do it. So it looks like a very safe place to work. And maybe, I don't know, do you need volunteers? There might be people out there who are watching who... Yeah. <laughs> who are willing to help you out in QI? Do you still need volunteers? Yeah, we, we, we just had the meeting. I think will be extended up to September because we're supposed to 
like uh, operationalized QI up to June, three months only. Right. But now there's a uh, word that we're extended up to September. Okay. Oh, if they want to volunteer, they're more more than welcome. Actually, how we treat our volunteers, we don't expose them to the ward. We we ask them to do like office work. We we do a lot of supplies uh, uh, and logistics, uh, packing. We have IT. We we claim we claim with PhilHealth the the reimbursement for patients with mild COVID. Okay, so that's, that's a lot of IT work on the computer. Think about um, extensions, uh, Doc Pao. Can we ask if there is a since sabi nyo kanina, tumataas yung numero ng COVID ano, infections since nag-GCQ tayo. Is there a possibility of extending the footprint and increasing the number of beds sa QI isolation facility? We're actually looking into that with the Philippine Red Cross, putting in more tents because uh, QI, as you all know, is really a big place. So we have room for more tents there. If we need to, we can admit more patients and put them in the tents now. Great. Okay. So I think, Raymond, maybe we can now go to the answers to the quiz. Yeah. Let's see if uh, they but, got but, correct. Dr. Pao, go. Yes. Yes, yes. Dr. Susi and Dr. Pao. I think we can go to the questions po ano po but before we go that uh, to that uh, to the post test webinar questions po may may we get confirmation from you doc pao that uh, your presentation is free to share to the attendees of this webinar ma'am yes of course yeah the more we know if you can uh, like make comments or suggestions it's more more than welcome yeah. i i told my staff in qi this is a work in progress we have a manual but we're updating the manual almost every week. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very generous offer of sharing your PowerPoint presentation. It will be uh, put to good use ng ating mga viewers, ating mga attendees as training aids, possible training aids sa kanilang okay. mga uh, hospitals. Great. Okay. Raymond, go. Uh, May we, may we be to play po our post? Mm -hmm. okay, um, uh, uh, okay, well, we're waiting for that. Okay. Uh, okay, go ahead. Is it up already? If not, we still have one question. Uh, there's a question here, Doc Pao. Since there's yes. a lot of asymptomatics, do you recommend seniors and immunocompromised individuals not to go out? Well, uh, really, that's the that's the dilemma that we have, because uh, but we've had patients in QI who are I, I think our oldest was seventy four or seventy five years old, and they were asymptomatic and they recovered without any symptoms at all. So I think it, it really depends on the individual, uh, the, the immune system, the health system, because not, not all the seniors and elderly will actually get critical or serious disease. Right. right. Yeah. I think we're seeing that. Okay. Uh, Raymond, you ready with the answers? Okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. Raymond, okay. Oh. What is the Raymond's garbled? I'll do it. What is the proportion of asymptomatic COVID nineteen positive cases? Uh, so, what is the correct answer to this talk, Paul? Uh, letter B, fifty percent. The eighty one percent is both asymptomatic and mild. Okay, so we have uh, about sixteen percent got that correct. The answer is 50%. So it's kind of like a trick question, right? Yes. <laughs> proportion, <laughs> parang board exam to eh. Proportion of asymptomatic COVID-19 positive cases. Okay. Number two, what is the most common comorbidity of COVID mild or asymptomatic cases in QI? 
Yes, that's correct. Hypertension. It's hypertension. Great. Okay, now I can't see the next one. What's the next question? Raymond, on the, the, yes, the, the next question, Dr. Susie reads, what is the number one rule or standard operating procedure at the QI uh, isolation facility? The top answer po is no mask, no entry. Tama po ba ito, Doc Pao? The, the correct answer, I put it in on my slides, is no touch policy. Oh, no limitang ire. <laughs> no limitang <laughs> No limit, no touch. Okay, I think um, we're gonna ask uh, we're gonna ask uh, AVP Rika if she has uh, a few parting words for us. Then we're gonna ask uh, Doc Pau to also give her final comment. So, uh, AVP Rika, anything on your end? Well, I'm very thankful to uh, Doc Pau for sharing all of this because you are Q QI is one of the first or the the first isolation. The first, the first. Yes. First, first, and uh, you created the protocols, no? Yes. And important yun talaga kasi lahat ng LGUs are uh, required, di ba, to have their own isolation facility para yung mga tao hindi na babalik sa kanilang community at we can stop the spread of COVID infection. So this is very important for everyone to know. So thank you for sharing your learnings and your experiences. Okay. Quezon Institute po. Maraming salamat po. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Okay, Pao. Uh, give your last uh, message and then ask for volunteers to help you up to September. Papalayan. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, the Quezon Institute Mild COVID Isolation Facility is really welcoming volunteers. We're trailblazing in this uh, particular um, aspect of healthcare because this is the first facility of its kind in uh, the Philippines and We've shared our protocol with so many LGUs already. And I was telling the mega facility, because it's manned by policemen, army, I don't think that their protocol is uh, like ours. Because they really treat the patients like uh, they're in jail, which <laughs> we, we don't want to do. Because I we have like Red Cross uh, <clears throat> stuff that are referred to ultra and they 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 don't feel good about it. In fact, some of our staff in in uh, welfare in here in Red Cross were saying, "Doctora, if our patients are sent to QI, they go uh, they they go fat and they're happy. If they go to the other facilities, they're lonely, they're sad." and they go thinner. <laughs> so yeah. I think uh, that's a lesson for all of us. It's not just about isolating them. It's about providing uh, the right kind of caring and well uh, wellness environment. Okay. Thank you. Are oh, you going to ask for volunteers now? How will they volunteer if they want to help you? I You, you can uh, email us at... QI, uh, Quezon Institute, MCIF at gmail.com. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pauline Obial, former Secretary of Health, medical volunteer for the Quezon Institute, yes. the first community isolation facility that we've seen. And I think she had a really important message, right? This is this is about caring for people who actually have an illness. And so it's very, very important that we think about the whole person we're not just trying to isolate, and we are in fact giving individuals uh, a positive experience. Uh, it's not their fault that they're. It's not their fault that they've they've gotten COVID, and I'm sure they like to be with their families. But dahil hindi pwede yon, mabuti may mga facilities tayo Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sekong. Uh, Raymond, did you have anything before I announce the next speaker? Raymond? Okay, I think Raymond is frozen. Are you in Bulacan already? <laughs> coming from Papanga. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. No, no questions. Uh, yes, po. No questions po from, uh, from my side. Uh, we just wanted to thank uh, and extend our congratulations to Dr. Obial for this wonderful uh, presentation po. And I think uh, this is the part wherein we invite our attendees to our next webinar. Uh, for next week, 
medyo na preempt lang po with one of our uh, public uh, publicity materials but obviously uh, it's something that's been a very important topic also COVID-19 and the heart. Dr. Susie? Yeah, we're going to have uh, Dr. Chito Permejo of uh, the Philippine Heart Center who will talk about COVID-19 and the heart. So next Friday, we'll see you again. Again, on behalf of um, Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, University of the Philippines, uh, we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Pauline Nabial for spending her precious time with us. She's very, very busy, but she's, she was with us today, and I hope you all <coughs> learned uh, from this webinar. And for those of you who are watching, uh, maraming salamat po na sumama kayo sa araw na ito, and we'll see you next Friday. Limon. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Susie Mercado. And I think that wraps up our webinar number seven. Uh, thank you to our distinguished speaker, resource person, former Secretary of Health, Dr. Pauline Jean Rosel Ubial. Makita-kita po tayo ulit next week for our webinar number eight, COVID-19 and the Heart. This is Dr. Raymond Sarmiento signing off. So please keep safe, keep healthy, and let's see each other online. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe.